Thank you. So, yeah, so my name is Micah. Uh, WP Scholar is how you find me. Uh, just Google that, you'll find me. Uh, <laughs> so basically, I work at uh, Bluehost. And uh, so I'm lucky enough to uh, get to contribute uh, to Core. Uh, most of the time I spend is contributing to Core. Uh, as well as I work on some internal stuff for Bluehost. Before that, I was um, doing a lot of enterprise uh, WordPress uh, development. So uh, that was a lot of fun, very interesting. Uh, was able to you know, flex my architecture and, and uh, WordPress muscles, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, so we're going to talk about the basic principles of software architecture. So this, uh, the point of this is not to go super deep, uh, but also uh, try to focus on the, the key aspects of really thinking through and putting software together in a way that will make sense and be robust and uh, more forward thinking. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at the overall software development lifecycle, uh, we kind of have these five basic parts, right? We have the requirements, you know, what is it that we're uh, trying to build? Uh, you have the design, how should we build it? The implementation, where you actually do it. Uh, QA, which of course is checking to make sure you actually did what you wanted to do. And then uh, maintenance is trying to essentially keep it effective, keep it long-term uh, effective for the client. Uh, so most of the time, uh, when you work with uh, agencies or people who are uh, just kind of get stuff out the door. A lot of times they just do the things that are on the top. They give you the requirements, you build the thing, and then they maintain it, right? And so the, the whole bottom half sometimes gets skipped over. Um, now, agencies like to cover their uh, rear, so they'll uh, throw in some QA, you know, some basic QA or something. Uh, but a lot of times the design of, you know, how should we build this thing before we actually get started on it gets overlooked. Uh, and so really just making space for that, uh, that stage is probably one of the biggest things you can do uh, to go in the right direction with designing your systems, right? Uh, actually design them. So, uh, but outside of that, uh, taking a look at what are the key things that clients care about uh, will help us to kind of focus our efforts in the, in the right direction. Uh, so one of the first things that obviously all clients care about is what things cost, right? Uh, if it's too expensive or maybe uh, too cheap, uh, <laughs> they're a little leery about what they're going to do. Uh, and then they care about the timeline. If, uh, if they're expecting to get something done in a week, they want it done in a week, not in a year, not in a month. Uh, uh, but at the same time, there are certain things that are definitely going to take longer. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, the effectiveness, right? So the effectiveness for the client now all right, is it going to work for them immediately? Is it going to work for them a month from now? Uh, you know, and then after you leave, is someone else going to be able to continue to maintain that effectiveness uh, and the, the business uh, be able to uh, make money continually off of whatever it is that you've built? So the first two things, the time and the cost, uh, are heavily impacted by the points in the design phase or implementation or delivery phases here uh, in which things happen, right? So the earlier that uh, a change uh, to the requirements or, uh, and sometimes it's not just a change to the requirements, sometimes it's just identifying that requirement that, uh, you know, kind of went undetected, right? Uh, it was an unspoken, the client assumed something, uh, but, you know, until inquiring minds come along and ask the right questions, uh, we don't know uh, about this particular thing, and it could heavily impact how we design our software. Uh, so the earlier in the stage, uh, the better. So if you can catch it in the design phase, uh, you'll be able to uh, make your change quickly and easily because it's all just on paper, it's just documentation. Uh, no code has been written, uh, no QA tests have been done. Um, but if you detect it during the implementation phase, which of course if you've already skipped the design phase and, and not done that at all, you're already behind on the curve, right? So, uh, so if you catch it in the implementation phase, uh, it's going to cost more money because you've already written code, you have to go back and change it, uh, as well as making sure everybody's on the same page about the fact that it changed. Maybe you've got three developers on the project. Uh, now, not only do you, you have to have somebody change the code, but you have to explain to the other developers why the code changed. Uh, and then at the delivery, um, obviously that is when it's going to cost the most time and effort to change it. And so, uh, 
And, and of course, really, the, uh, what we're talking about here is most of these changes uh, are just going to take lots of time. And so that translates not just to extending the timeline, but also to the cost of the client uh, for all the hours and work that goes into it. So, uh, so really, the, the time and cost, we kind of understand how that works. We understand that we have to catch these things early. Uh, so that kind of leaves the biggest kind of open-ended thing as the effectiveness, right? Uh, what makes something effective? How do we keep it effective? Uh, how does that work? So in order for something to be effective, first it actually has to solve the problem, right? The client comes, they have a problem, we have a solution. Um, and then once we've uh, put the solution together, we want to make sure that it's easy to maintain long term, right? So if we can create a solution that works today, but you can't actually uh, make any changes to it in the future, uh, that is going to be worth uh, not a lot to the business because they're going to have to rewrite it and pay more money all over again later to redo it. Um, <coughs> so we want to make sure that we focus not just on the now, but on uh, making sure it's easy to maintain. And in, to some degree, uh, you know, we see this a lot in WordPress where somebody uh, creates a, a theme or some sort of uh, thing for a client. Uh, that client uh, is happy, but then they decide that uh, maybe things aren't performant or it's not exact. They want to make some design changes. Uh, problem is that the developer who did it is now busy or off doing other things, so they have to find somebody new. The new developer says, "Oh, I can't, can't. Uh, that's that's not why we work. How we work? We're going to just scrap this and start over." So you see it a lot more than uh, once you start thinking about it, uh, where we kind of get something that solves the problem now but it's not easy to maintain. Other developers don't know what's going on with it. Uh, you know, they've got uh, so many layers to the system, so much complexity that no one else wants to work on it. Uh, so that's part of the, the problem that we have to resolve. So there's an equation. Uh, it's a real simple equation. You just do it in your head. Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, once you get uh, more familiar with this, it is something that you can kind of process a little bit in your head. But having an equation where you can actually put dollar signs on all of these variables uh, and be able to calculate, uh, you know, when evaluating two different options, uh, what you should actually do or whether one solution is better than another. Uh, it's good to have this in your back pocket. So this is a, a, an equation. If you want to know where we found it, it's, uh, there's this great little book called Code Simplicity. Uh, at the end of the slides, which I'll share out after, um, I have a list of uh, books and things that I would highly recommend if you're interested in this topic. Uh, but essentially what this says is that the desirability of a change is equal to the value of that change now plus the value of that change in the future divided by the effort of implementation plus the effort of maintenance. Uh, and the reality is that the effort of implementation is typically pretty low considering. It's the effort of maintaining something long term that is really the determining factor as to whether or not a particular change is a good solution or not. Uh, so you want to make sure that uh, that as you're making changes, you have that focus on maintainability in the future. Um, so practically, how do we focus on that maintainability aspect, right? Uh, how do we lower that portion of the equation and make all of the changes that we do more desirable? Uh, so. One thing, uh, just to keep in mind, this isn't really like a, uh, uh, well, so technical debt is one of those things that you hear about uh, where essentially technical debt is nothing more than uh, you've taken shortcuts in the code and ultimately what's happened is uh, those shortcuts are costing you in maintenance, right? Uh, so those shortcuts are causing complexity in the code uh, difficulties where when you go to maintain that code, uh, you have a hard time reading that code, understanding that code, being able to uh, put additional uh, layers on top of it, uh, plug into it, uh, those kinds of things. So technical debt, just like uh, high credit card uh, APRs, will kill you. Uh, so you want to make sure that, uh, for one, try not to take those shortcuts. Try to uh, focus on those things that will prevent you from incurring technical debt. Um, and some of those things are just keeping certain things like this in mind. So the law of change. Basically what this says is that the longer that your program exists, 
the more likely that any part of it is going to have to change. Uh, and this is relatively obvious, but um, when you think about it, uh, you know, these, these are, uh, they call them laws because essentially there's really no way around it, right? Uh, the longer the program exists, the more features the client's going to want, the more things are going to be put into it, and the more likely, you know, it's going to change. Uh, so we also have the law of defect probability. So this is uh, because of the law of change, right? So we know that things are going to change. Uh, so this law basically says that the chance of introducing a defect is proportional to the size of the changes that you make, right? So when we have an option to uh, add a feature, and we can make a change that's small, or we can make a change that kind of affects multiple files in the code as opposed to just one. Uh, the chances of defects go up significantly if you have to touch five files as opposed to touch just one. Uh, so again, as you can see, these are uh, starting to make a little bit more sense as we look at them. Uh, and then we have the law of simplicity, which basically says that the ease of your maintenance is proportional to the simplicity of the individual pieces. So the simpler we can make the individual pieces, the more confined we can keep the logic and prevent things from touching multiple files or spanning across uh, classes all over the place, uh, then the easier maintenance will be. So when you're designing a system, simplicity is key. Uh, you want to make sure that it's easy to understand, easy to modify, and then easy to test. Uh, so those sound simple, uh, but there are some things that will definitely help you uh, do that better. So one of these is self-documenting code. I think uh, most people get the concept of naming things clearly and that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of times we'll write uh, functions and we'll put a uh, uh, documentation just above that function in the code that kind of documents what that code does. And then what happens is somebody will come and change the code and not update the documentation. So what you end up with is documentation that just lies to you. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's an easy mistake to make, right? Uh, you forget to, to update the documentation, you make a change, you just want to test it and make sure it works before you actually go changing documentation. Uh, so it's an easy thing to forget. Uh, so really the best thing that you can do is make sure that the code itself is documenting itself as much as possible. Uh, and the way that you do this is just making sure that instead of uh, using vague or super abbreviated variable names or function uh, names that you make them maybe a little longer just to make them a little clearer, right? Uh, so if you're reading an if statement and it says if false equals uh, stir pause, uh, you know, dollar sign, uh, post, whatever, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that's hard to read, but if, if you've created a little function that has a very clear name, like uh, if, uh, you know, if post type is, <laughs> or something like that, and you, and you have that function, then when you write your if statement, now you're saying if uh, this post is of post type, uh, it's, a little, it's a lot easier to read. So clear naming, sectioning those things off into small specific functions that you can use uh, in ways that are just very clear and easy to read. Because um, we all know that in six months we're gonna have to come back and change this code, and if you can't understand it, um, God knows no one else will understand it either. So, uh, so then this is another uh, big one here is making sure that you limit the cognitive load. Uh, so this is important because uh, studies have been done. Uh, your brain can only hold so much in memory at any given time, right? So we've probably all uh, encountered uh, software solutions where you end up uh, starting to dig into a problem and you realize, okay, so we have this, this thing here. Uh, I understand this, but it's uh, somehow linked to this little function over here. Uh, so let me look into that. But that little function links off to this thing here and that thing there. And then uh, those two things happen to link out somewhere else, which circles back around here, but this one goes off somewhere else. Uh, and so in the end, you're sitting there, you're like, okay, so wait a minute. Well, where did we start? Uh, and so it's really hard to keep track if, if you have this wide-spanning uh, array of things, right? Uh, so consolidating the logic uh, into one place makes it, A, easier to follow and limits your cognitive load because you can only keep so much in your mind. This is why when uh, we do code review, 
uh, they say to limit your code review to 200 lines of code. If you get more than 200 lines of code in a code review, uh, you're going to get really bad code reviews. People are going to miss things. Um, I've seen plenty of code reviews come through where somebody just had a die in the, in the code uh, and they forgot to take it out, but nobody picked it up because they had submitted a thousand line uh, change and somebody was just kind of reading through it and it's easy to miss that kind of thing, right? So if you can limit the cognitive load, uh, it'll make it a lot easier to understand the system. It'll make it a lot easier for other people to understand the system. Some people are better at, uh, at having more in their mind of the system uh, than others. Uh, so we want to make sure that even if we happen to be, uh, have that particular ability, that we try to restrict that as much as possible. Uh, the other thing is making sure that we have clear boundaries, right? So if we have clear boundaries in our system, uh, that means that we're not going to have uh, multiple things that span off into other, uh, other classes or other modules or other things like that. Uh, we'll have a clear boundary where this module connects to this module, but only by this one particular uh, function call or, or simple API. Uh, and it'll be a lot easier to mentally track that. Uh, so that is a, a big, big thing to keep in mind. Uh, we've all heard this, don't repeat yourself. So uh, I like to start with this Latin proverb, repetition is the mother of learning. Uh, repeating yourself is good when you're learning, right? Uh, but every programmer ever will tell you, don't repeat yourself. Uh, so, you know, you write code, uh, somebody says, ah, I see you have the same uh, uh, conditional here as you have here. Uh, why don't you create a function for that conditional and use it in both places? Um, and in certain cases, that makes sense, right? Um, but this is, there's a myth. The myth is that if I was a good coder, then all the code I would write would be dry and there wouldn't be a need for all this uh, repetition, right? So we all encounter repetition in our code uh, and sometimes we allow it, sometimes we don't. Uh, and in certain cases, it's actually good. Uh, when we take a look at where this rule essentially came from, uh, back in 1960s, I believe, it was the book, The Pragmatic Programmer. Uh, is basically where this came from. So it says that every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. Uh, so when we read that, we, we don't instantly think, oh, the dry principle, right? Uh, it's a very different statement. Um, but so I've thought a, thought a bit about this, uh, and I think there's uh, some clear distinctions to be made uh, when you're thinking about repetition in your code. Uh, so the first is that the dry principle really applies mostly to the duplication of knowledge. So the duplication of knowledge is a violation of the dry principle. Uh, however, duplication of code in general, meaning, uh, well, duplication of code in general is not a violation. So uh, the difference there is that knowledge is essentially data, business logic, algorithms, uh, anything that is essentially related to the business domain uh, is important business logic that should not be replicated. If you think about a shopping cart, uh, if you happen to have the uh, shopping cart page and the checkout page and you have the logic for, let's say, removing an item from the cart or the, uh, you could do that from either page, right? Uh, if the uh, code for each, uh, page ran a different function to remove the item, you are duplicating the logic for removing an item from the shopping cart. Uh, and obviously in doing that, the next piece of logic you need to add related to removing an item from the shopping cart, uh, a developer may only do it in one place. And then you have different logic happening in two different places. So uh, this is very easy to do, uh, but it's important to create the distinction that Code includes variables, code structures, and function calls, which it is perfectly fine to duplicate. Uh, so if you happen to have, for example, an MVC uh, structure that you use, and maybe in one case you have a uh, display for uh, one particular post type and a display for another particular post type, uh, a lot of times when you see two post types that are very similar, it's very tempting to merge those data or those code structures together uh, because the, the logic and everything appears to be the same. Um, 
But uh, so there's kind of two sides to the coin here. So the first one is uh, something called premature optimization. So this is where you essentially apply the dry principle before you need it. Uh, and so you assume uh, that there will be a, uh, or assume that there's a duplication of knowledge and that you should uh, uh, fix it before it happens. Uh, so that's kind of applies to the Yagni principle. Uh, you ain't gonna need it. Uh, and then we have uh, essentially the opposite side of this, which is where we uh, apply to our coding structures uh, the dry principle when really they, they do have different applications, right? So if you have uh, kind of this MVC structure or something for two different post types, uh, eventually those post types will get different business logic. And now you've automatically coupled all of the code for both of these post types and now you have to undo that in order to add the features that you need to add. Uh, so obviously you want to make sure that you create that distinction between duplication of knowledge, of logic, as opposed to coding structures in general. And so we see this a lot with uh, WordPress where we have function calls like register post type. Um, you know, so that we, we, we will call register post type for obviously multiple post types and that code is very similar uh, but it is very different at the same time because we're creating different post types, they have different requirements. Um, so those structures are, are different. So yeah, here's the, you ain't gonna need it. Uh, so try not to prematurely optimize your code, uh, but also don't uh, inadvertently couple things that, are, that appear to be similar but are not actually the same. Uh, and then we have the most misunderstood uh, solid principle in existence, <clears throat> which is the single responsibility principle. Uh, everyone assumes that the single responsibility principle, based on its definition, uh, means that uh, you should have a function that does only one thing, or a class that does only one thing. And while this is true, you should limit the scope of your methods or functions, the scope of your classes, and make sure they're very cohesive. Uh, so cohesiveness is very important. Uh, when you're coding. So you're not entirely wrong if, if that's what you think about the single responsibility principle. Uh, the real uh, logic behind the single responsibility principle is that a class or module should have only one reason to change. And what that means is, uh, let's, say you <clears throat> let's say you have code uh, that is uh, going to render a report. So you've got the actual content of the report that could change. You've got the actual display or formatting of the report that could change. And if you put all that logic together and you generate the content for the report and display it in a particular format all at the same time, uh, then there's two reasons that code could change. One could be they want it to look different. One could be the content of the report needs to change, the formulas, the logic, that kind of thing. And so if you put those two things together, uh, let's say you wanted to, uh, you know, a new feature came about, oh, well, we actually need to generate the same report but in two different formats. Well, now you've coupled two things that shouldn't be put together. Uh, so that is the real application of the single responsibility principle. And it doesn't just apply in those types of concepts. Uh, it also applies to the types of uh, changes that people or departments might request, right? So uh, if you've got um, a, for example, uh, a class that handles logic for uh, uh, working with uh, loans, for example. So you've got a... Uh, a bank, they have loans, they have logic related to the loans, um, or uh, you know, you, you might have a CFO that will make certain decisions, you might have a CTO that will make certain decisions, and so they'll have, uh, it's important to kind of create distinctions as well uh, as to you know, who might re be requesting a change, uh, and usually what departments are making changes will kind of map to things like the formatting of a, of a, form, of a report or the content of a report. Uh, so it's just important to kind of think through as you're looking at your code, you know, who are the stakeholders, what types of changes or responsibilities do those particular people or departments have, uh, and how will that play out in future changes to the code. Another key principle um, is the open-close principle. This is something that I think uh, WordPress does very well, for example, with the uh, plugin system. Uh, and the uh, actions and hooks and things that we use in WordPress uh, make it easy for you to, at any point in WordPress, uh, kind of 
run your own code or modify uh, variables and things inside of WordPress uh, is the open close principle, right? So we don't modify WordPress core directly, but we can extend WordPress through plugins uh, to be able to do very different things with WordPress. Uh, and that's part of the beauty and the power of WordPress itself. And in reality, when we look at the open close principle, if we have a solid architecture where we've created clear boundaries um, and clear ways of extending the code, uh, we'll be able to have better application of the open and close principle. Uh, so for example, uh, let's say you've got, uh, uh, let's say most, most of the time when you create uh, code, you're trying to create clear boundaries bet between different types of things. So you've got, for example, the UI, uh, what the user sees, how, how things are being displayed. You've got the business logic, which is kind of another layer that's often in there. You've got the, uh, uh, the data storage and all those different kinds mm -hmm. of things. And then a lot of times you'll kind of have uh, more vertical uh, splits as well, where uh, you know, maybe you know, in a shopping cart you say, well, this is all related to products, this is all related to the checkout process, this is all related to uh, you know, something else. Uh, so we have all these different uh, boundaries and things, uh, but you want to make sure that um, as you're creating the system that it's easy to extend, and there's many ways that you can extend uh, code, right? We have classes that can be extended. We have composition where you can take uh, 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 traits or uh, use functional composition to, to add in uh, code to existing classes, things like that. Uh, but then we also have a, a very easy way to do that in WordPress, which is the uh, hook system. So not only does WordPress have its own way of creating hooks, uh, ac uh, actions, and filters, uh, but, of course, you and your own plugins and things can do that as well. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we can uh, create modules and things. Uh, if we use tools like Composer, uh, we can create uh, entities, software entities that we can uh, use as dependencies and easily extend or leverage those in our code as well. Uh, so the open-close principle is uh, something that WordPress does well, and I think that in general, as we're thinking about uh, creating a good system, it's important to keep in mind. Uh, so we're going to take a closer look here at modularity for a second. Um, so we have, again, one of the first things that uh, you should think about is making sure you have clear boundaries. Uh, so your modules should very clearly uh, you know, pertain to a particular aspect. So we're talking about cohesion, right? So we want to make sure that we have cohesion within our modules, that we're not putting things that don't go in there, that we're splitting them out into the right pieces. Uh, so we also want to make sure it's decoupled. And obviously, when we're talking about boundaries, the assumption is that it's decoupled, but it's very easy to create tightly coupled modules, uh, even though there's clear boundaries. Uh, <laughs> and one of the ways that that can happen, um, well, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, so it's easy to couple things uh, inadvertently. Uh, so it's easy to write a module that assumes that other modules will be there. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you have a very clear and clean API, um, again, that clearly defines those boundaries. Uh, continuity is just a, a reinforcement of kind of the single responsibility principle. So continuity basically means that when you have a module and uh, someone requests a change, the changes that are requested should only impact a small, uh, a single module, ideally, or maybe a couple of adjacent modules uh, in minor ways. So uh, what that means is that you've properly mapped uh, the responsibilities of your uh, code to uh, the reasons why the code might change. And so continuity basically says, you know, if the CFO asks for this change, then we've properly modularized the business logic or the display logic or whatever it is so that it only affects that one particular module, that one particular class or whatever it may be. And then we have protection. And protection is one of those things where if done incorrectly, it actually makes it uh, less clear what the boundaries are for our module as well as allows you to, even though you've created a module that you seem uh, seems to have clear boundaries, allows those boundary lines to become blurred is if you don't properly protect your, uh, your module, right? So let's say you have a class and 
Uh, it's very common for people when they create classes to, instead of marking particular proper properties as protected, they'll just write public, right? And so all the things are public. Well now, instead of having to use the very clear and clean uh, collection of methods and things for that particular class, uh, which would create clear boundaries, prevent uh, coupling of things that shouldn't be coupled, well now, another module can reach directly into your module using the public access that you've left behind. And they can do things that they really shouldn't be able to do, um, but because, you know, as developers, we like shortcuts, uh, and if it's easier to go straight into it and manipulate it uh, how we want, then that's what we'll do. Uh, so if you don't properly protect your module, uh, then that's, that's where your boundaries get blurred, that's where coupling uh, kind of sneaks in, and essentially you're sabotaging your own code. So you want to make sure that you think about, you know, what is the public API, what, is the th what are the things that need to happen behind the scenes, and make sure too that we limit as much as possible the public API. Because the larger the public API, the more complicated uh, change would be in the future. Um, so, and just another, um, oh yeah, and then of course extensibility, talking about the open-close principle. Uh, I'm not going into all of the solid principles uh, because I think they're a little, some of them are a little deeper. Um, I'll probably do a talk later on all of them at some point, but, um, but yeah, so we have extensibility. Um, we want to think about making sure that our modules are easy to extend with custom functionality, uh, or maybe even, you know, uh, hooks, filters, using some sort of event-based system uh, as well, uh, but without changing the actual code itself. And so now we have the reuse release principle, which to me is a very important principle, uh, because as software developers, uh, one of the things that we do over time that really helps us uh, get better at what we do, get faster at what we do, and uh, continue to, I guess, further our career is, you know, we start out building things from scratch. We learn how things work. Uh, we start to write cleaner code. Uh, we start to realize there's patterns that we use over and over again. And then we realize that um, we use these certain patterns so much that we could actually abstract them and turn them into modules or turn them into uh, you know, different plugins or things, uh, and we can reuse them, right? Uh, but the reuse of those things is only as valuable as the tracking system in which you put them. Uh, so, for example, on WordPress.org, we have a tracking system for plugins. We have uh, plugins, they're all versioned, they're all in one location. It's easy to find, easy to get a particular version, uh, it's easy to update, <clears throat> and so that code is very easy to reuse. Uh, if we have, for example, GitHub, and we put our plugins there, uh, that is good. Uh, it's a good tracking system, but again, it's one of those things where it's more difficult to pull our code in directly from GitHub. Uh, you know, we're not, uh, we're not reusing those things in mass uh, through GitHub, right? No, no client's going to say, oh, I'll just clone that Git repo and use your plugin, right? Uh, <laughs> So a lot of times that, you know, that's where we, we have our testing grounds for plugins that we don't want clients to use, but we want developers to use, right? So it's a good system for that, uh, but it's not good for, for the user. Um, but really, as developers, we are users, right? Like we, we need to reuse our code and we need to make it easy on ourselves to do that. And it's not practical to uh, have a project that you want to have version controlled and then to try to clone seven or 10 different Git repos in that and then you can't track those things because they're submodules, and it, but you don't like Git submodules, so that you have to remove Git from those things. It gets complicated. Uh, so that's why we have awesome tools like Composer. So if you use PHP, there's Composer. Um, if you use JavaScript, uh, there's NPM, Node uh, Package Manager, right? So you can actually, um, from NPM, grab any JavaScript module that exists out there. You can pull it into your project. It's real easy to do with command line. Uh, and now your JavaScript's in there and you can start to use it. Uh, just like you do that, we have Composer. Uh, all of the things live up on packages.org. They could be registered. Um, there's a cool uh, little project called wpackages.org where all of the WordPress.org plugins and themes have been Composerified for you and are ready to use and pull into your WordPress projects. Um, 
And likewise, you don't, it doesn't have to be plugins or themes that you package up. It can be individual libraries that you use. For example, one that I've created is a uh, WordPress uh, post expiration module, right? So a lot of times you have a client and they request that, uh, you know, maybe you're creating promotions for them as a post type. They want to be able to expire it. Maybe they have ads uh, they want to expire. Maybe they have news articles they want to expire. Whatever the case is, uh, all I have to do, Composer require my package, add a single line that says uh, add post type support expiration for a particular post type, and now uh, that thing will automatically have the user interface for post expiration and will automatically have the cron set up to expire those things and I don't have to do anything additional. And that automatically gives me packaged into a theme, packaged into a plugin. Um, so whatever custom theme I'm thing I am building for a client, I can uh, easily reuse that. Uh, and of course, everything on packages or used via Composer is also versioned. Uh, so understanding semantic versioning uh, is very important, making sure that you uh, understand uh, the differences uh, between the uh, Breaking changes, non-breaking changes, uh, feature additions, patches, all those kinds of things. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, you can go to simver.org and learn about semantic versioning uh, so you can properly manage uh, things that are tracked uh, in version control. Uh, so reuse release pr principle, very important. Uh, but this is kind of my favorite quote. So there's this uh, book called Clean Architecture, uh, Robert Martin, also known as Uncle Bob, uh, has written. And his quote is that a good software architect will delay decisions for as long as possible. I used to think that software architecture was knowing all the things and making them all work together perfectly. Uh, and really it's not. It's all about delaying decisions as long as possible. And what that really means is, let's say you're writing some software. Uh, you start with the, the business logic. You start from the inside and you work your way out. Uh, when you're designing business logic, you do not need to know where the data will be stored. You do not need to know what the user interface will look like. Uh, you do not need to know, nor do you need to create any of those things. You just need to design the business logic and create some basic tests for the business logic. Uh, and the business logic is anything that uh, outside of, let's say, the web or any kind of software. Uh, business logic is the thing that is at the core of the business, right? Uh, so if you are a bank, uh, you extend loans to people, uh, you know, you create accounts, uh, you have all these different things that you do, and it doesn't matter whether you have an online system or not, those things are going to happen. That is core business logic. Uh, extending beyond that, we have use cases. So the use cases are the things that apply specifically to an automated system uh, that operate on that business logic. So being able to create an account online or to request a loan uh, online, those are use cases that interact with the core business logic of uh, the business, right? So you want to make sure that you start with the business logic, delay the other decisions about how to create an account online or do these different things within the automated system until the business logic has been sorted out and is, uh, meets requirements. So then you have these use cases and we still don't care about where the data is stored, what the uh, user sees when they go to create an account. All we care about is that the automated system can handle and manage what's going to happen there. And then from there, finally, we'll start to make decisions about where the data is stored, whether or not we use WordPress. Uh, all of those things are actually irrelevant until you get to the point where you really need to make the decision. Uh, and that decision may change later. Uh, but again, talking about delaying decisions, if you make them before uh, you've implemented them, it's going to be a lot easier to do. Uh, a lot simpler to do, and if you've written your code in a way where it will allow you to delay that decision, then you're actually doing it correctly because uh, you're also causing, uh, so if you start with that business logic, work out to the use cases, work out to the, to the interfaces, uh, essentially you're, you're automatically going to properly uh, set up your dependencies for your software, right? We don't ever want to have the business logic depending on where the data is stored or how the data is stored. Uh, we don't want someone to say, well, the process of, a, of creating an account depends on whether the MySQL database is available. If that is the case, then the business logic has a problem, right? Uh, but if you start from the inside out and delay all those decisions, 
then the business logic will never depend on the MySQL database. The business logic will never depend on what the user sees or how they interact with the system. It will always just work the way that it's supposed to. Um, and so these are the resources that I would recommend. Uh, Sourcemaking.com is a good website. Uh, DoFactory.com, uh, JavaScript design patterns. Um, there's a great book on PHP design patterns. Uh, the clean code and clean architecture. That's uh, Uncle Bob or uh, Robert Martin. Uh, really good books. Code Simplicity, that's the one where that uh, formula and a lot of these uh, laws and principles that you saw on some of the slides came from. And then uh, refactoring, so if you ever do any kind of heavy refactoring or taking legacy systems and converting it into uh, you know, more modern structures and proper architecture, uh, that's a good book to read. So uh, yeah, so that's my talk. Uh, I think we got, how much time do we have for questions? Got about five minutes. Five minutes, so. Any questions? Anybody? So, yeah. So uh, it makes not, I'm sorry, not any sense, but uh, when you start reading about uh, startups and how you want to get first to the market and test the idea, they say code fast, put to the market, and let the users test, which is kind of goes in the opposite direction of what you're saying. Is there a balance on when you should? really code fast put on the market or you believe that that's the only right way to do it? Um, so yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, when is the right time to code quickly, get something to market, uh, so that you, from a business perspective, can leverage the, uh, the yeah, uh, uh, yeah, getting to market first as opposed to doing it right, maybe coming to market a little later. Um, and again, I think it really depends uh, to a certain degree uh, if we look at, at the competition, right, if they're doing the quick and dirty version, then what they're ending up with is a system that works now, but it's going to be difficult to maintain. And so as a startup, if you focus on doing it right, and the logic is there, and the dependencies are set up correctly, then your system is going to be easier to maintain, easier to add features long term, which means you could outlast the competition. Now, granted, there is a benefit to coming to market first, um, but really, I think uh, this particular process of starting from the inside and working your way out and making those decisions later uh, can actually give you more flexibility coming to market first uh, because maybe you realize that there's a, a new technology that's coming out. You're not sure if it's going to work yet. Uh, you need to give it a month. Uh, you can delay that decision, whereas somebody else is trying to get something out the door. They just go with what they know. And then it turns out that the technology decision was a brilliant one. Uh, you can transition. Uh, or maybe that was flipped around and you need to update to the new technology. Because you've built your system this way, uh, there's not that uh, dependency that shouldn't be there. And it makes it easier to just swap out this technology with this other technology. So uh, personally, I think it makes a lot more sense uh, to start from the inside out, build it. Uh, but, but really, uh, I would say the rules are uh, it's OK to build it quick and then to uh, build it right. Uh, but if you, if you know you're never going to get around to building it right, uh, then just build it right. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of my, my rule of thumb, I guess. So list those things again one more time. So it's a, an event list. You can search events by city. Um, and then you have product positions throughout the location. So you do a location finder. Um, and then users can sign up and create a membership and have a profile. And use the profile. So yeah, so the way I would kind of approach, and the question is, you know, how would you build? It's a, you said it's a membership mm -hmm. type site where you have events, you have locations, and you have one more thing. There user profiles, right? Uh, so really, if you think about it from a uh, community perspective, let's say you actually physically met up in person or have events, right? Which essentially you would be doing, I guess, unless they're online events. Uh, there's there's that, that business logic of, you know, uh, we have an event, you know, an event is an entity within the system. Uh, the event is going to have a date, it's going to have a time, it's going to have these things. You can create code that just manages that particular entity or uh, portion of the system, right? 
So you're going to have that uh, event entity, you'll have the location entity, you'll have the user entity, and the fact that it's a profile is really more of a, a data rendering aspect. Uh, so you'll start with those things. Uh, and then of course the, the, uh, the use cases would be updating my password, uh, you know, creating events in the system online. Uh, those, are the, those are the use cases. They're not core business logic. They're related to the automated system. So you start with the, the core entity, you build out those use cases, and then you say, okay, I, I know what a user looks like and what can be done with a user. Uh, I've created the automated s tools that allow me to create a new user, delete a user, change a password, manipulate that particular entity, uh, and then working your way out from there saying, okay, well, what is the profile display going to look like? Uh, you know, create the view or template or whatever for that. Uh, and then where's that data going to be stored? How I'm going to work with it? Um, you know, and so, you know, WordPress obviously has uh, its own tools and things that you can use for some of that. Uh, but again, you should look at WordPress as a uh, technical detail. Uh, so WordPress, just like anything else, is not core to the business. It's not really specifically related to that particular use case. It may be a tool you use to implement the use case, but it's on the outer fringe of the design. So, uh, so can you, I guess, just clarify what, just from a development perspective, what the use case would be versus the business logic? So the actual like, things that were linked to the event, the location, so the use cases, and how we set it up would be the business logic? Yeah so the, yeah, so the question is, what is the difference between, a, uh, between business logic and a use case? So business logic is, again, something that would happen regardless of whether or not we have a web system uh, or some online tool or software tool. Uh, so, so for a user to exist, right, users have names. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, there's certain information that you as an organization care about when it comes to that person. Uh, so if it's uh, something you'd write down in a notebook, whether or not you had an online system or not, it's probably important and something that you should keep track of within the, the person or member uh, entity. And then, you know, for your events, you know, what are the things that you would be marketing whether or not you had a, a website? Uh, so those are the things that, that are core business logic. And then the things that allow you to work with WordPress to manage those things, those are use cases. Uh, so, yes, being able to uh, log into WordPress and create a new user, that is a use case. Uh, so the user is the core entity. Creating that user is something you do through the automated system. Uh, you know, that user would exist regardless in real life, but, uh, but the automated system aspect, that's where that use case comes in. So. All right, we'll have to cut it off right here, but let's give Mike a big round of applause.